Hi everyone. So today we'll continue our lectures uh, with elementary programming. We'll finish the chapter on elementary programming and then we'll continue with selections. So we stopped right here last time. Basically we saw the difference between the post increment and the pre increment. The same increment operator, but applied after the variable, the, it will increment the variable i, but uh, the value of the expression is the old value of i. That's why it's called the post increment of the expression. The pre increment basically increments the variable i, and then the value of the expression is the new variable, the new value of the variable i. And you can see the differences. Basically, the moment that we transform those two um, pieces of code, the first one will become defining the variable i. New number is 10 multiplied with the old value of i, and i is incremented with 1. So basically, the effect of this code is that the new number is 100, i is 11, because it's incremented with 1 from 10. The second code, the only difference, syntactical difference, is that we have a pre-increment of i, meaning that i is first defined and equal with 10, then i is incremented with 1, because this is a pre-increment, and then new number is 10 multiplied with a new value of i. So the difference is in the value of new number. In both of them, i will be incremented to 11, but new number in the post increment version is 100, and in the pre increment version is 110. And that's where we stopped last time. So we'll continue with uh, the rest of this chapter. So, first thing scientific notation. So like in mathematics, it's common that we can represent floating point number, numbers using the scientific notation. The meaning that we have the uh, exponent e followed by a positive or a negative number or a number without sign, which is considered to be positive. Meaning that we take actually the number that was represented and we multiply it with the base to the power of that exponent. So in the case of 1.23456e plus 2 means that we multiply this number with 10 to the power 2, which is 100. So this will actually be equal with 123.456. Similarly, 1.23456 exponent minus 2 multiplies that number with 10 to the power minus 2. So basically it divides it with 100, meaning that we get 0 0.01 and the rest of the digits. Do we need to include the plus or minus? Uh, basically, you don't need to. Uh, by default, if we don't actually put the unary operator plus, it in, it's interpreted as a positive number, as a positive uh, exponent. Negative, you actually need to include a negative uh, minus operator. So these are actually unary operators that appear in front of one operand or one expression. And it's basically uh, uh, the value of that expression in positive or negative. OK. Now, the way that these doubles are internally implemented is uh, with a standard called the IEEE 7454 standard which basically says that floating point numbers are represented internally as binary based to fractions. So when you represent like, for instance, 0.5, actually the way that that is represented is uh, one divided by two. Similarly, if you want to represent 20, uh, 0 0.25, one divided by four. Every other number is 0 0.75 is one divided by two plus one divided by four. So most decimal fractions cannot be exactly represented as binary fractions. So all of these floating point numbers that we basically have in Java and other programming languages, this is a standard for all programming languages, are uh, approximate values. And why is this important? Because we will actually see in a couple of minutes, uh, you can actually do quite in imprecise operations with, uh, by, uh, with uh, double values. There is another representation for numbers in Java is called big decimal, which for every finite number of digits after the decimal point, it actually represented exactly because it represents that number 
as a string. And basically that way, you know that it's a precise representation. So let's continue the rest of the slides. The second slide is about, the next slide is about classes. So in Java, a program is a class. Uh, uh, any file, any Java file may contain multiple classes. However, only one of them can be a public class. And that's actually the, it must have the same name with the name of the file. So if it's, this is a class name, the name of the file will be class name .java. okay? Now, those classes that we want to execute, they must be public and they must contain a method, public static void main method that takes an array of strings as the argument. Later this semester, we'll also see that the class is not only a program in Java, but can also be used as a template to construct objects with multiple data fields, okay? So I will just show you that very fast in Java. Let's say that we want to create a new class. Let's call it person. And the person class has multiple data fields. So let's say that it has public uh, string name or first name. Then it has public string last name. And it has a constructor. A constructor is a special type of method that allows you to create an object of the type person. So public person takes first name and last name. And then it actually, let's define their types. And it assigns to the current object's first name the first variable and for the second one, the last variable. So this is what I mean that the class is also a, a, a way to actually define a template and you can define multiple persons. So person uh, Paul is a new person. with the first name Paul and the last name Paul. And similarly, I can create as many person as persons that I want. So another person, let's say John is John Smith. So the advantage of this is that you can actually now access the first name of Paul, the last name of Paul, the first name of John, the last name of John. So really a class plays two roles in Java. One is to define objects that have multiple data fields. It's kind of like a com complex class, a complex template. And that's the way that I used it in this file. And another one is to actually have a main method that executes some code that you basically want to run and you want to, let's say, print the uh, names of these two people, okay? So system.out.println. Let's say that I want to print the first name followed by the second name of every one of these two people. So Paul's first name followed by a space followed by Paul's last name. And similarly, we can do it for John, okay? John, and we have the first name of John and John and the last name of John. And we have to execute them. We basically can see that, first of all, we use that pattern to create two people. And then we use for every single, single one of those two, uh, the properties, first name and last name. When you say template, does that mean that you use it as a package, sort like uh, sort of an, in a new project? 
when I mean a template, I actually, what I mean is a complex type, a type like person that has multiple fields inside it. Okay. So in uh, C, for instance, this was called the structure. You, you had the primitive types, but then you want to create more uh, types that have multiple fields. This entire idea of object-oriented programming actually started with databases. In databases, you have an entire set of attributes that corresponds to one instance of, the, of a tuple in the database. So that's exactly the same idea. A template is like a schema that a person has these properties. And then when you initialize a person, you know that you initialize it with those exact properties and you can access them and you can assign to them new values. Okay. But we will get back to classes later this semester. Welcome. So basically a class is either you can use it as, the, uh, as an entry point when you run a program or you use it as a template or blueprint for objects. Methods. Methods are basically collections of statements that are performed as a sequence of operations when you invoke that method. And you can invoke, so usually a method takes arguments. And we can actually can show you this method that I had, this constructor that I had here. So you call it with two arguments. These are the formal parameters, first and last, that are inside the method. And when you invoke it, you invoke it with uh, actual parameters. So person of Paul and Fodor. So Paul will be passed as a parameter to first and Fodor will be passed as a parameter to last. So basically a method is like a method in mathematics, a function in mathematics, sinus of uh, radius or sinus of, uh, uh, or cosinus of a number of degrees. It's exactly the same idea, a method is basically a collection of statements that will be executed when you invoke that method. So when I invoke the method, it, out, it basically executes these statements sequentially. First one, second one, third one, and so on, up to the end of the, met, uh, end of the method. So that's exactly what a method is. It's a collection of statements that performs a sequence of operations when it's invoked. And you invoke it usually with arguments and those arguments are sent to the method formal parameters and the method is executed with those values. The main method is just one method. It's basically a method that has a standard signature, public, static, void, and then the main method. It has a string of uh, an array of uh, strings as the arguments and is basically the main entrance point for the program when you try to run that program. In fact, having a main method makes the class executable because if a class doesn't have a main method you can't execute it like you would in the jvm with the java command basically what it means to have a main method is that we can compile it and run it it will know that running it means to start running the statements in the main method not all classes requires main method there are classes like for instance my person class that was used as a template and doesn't require a main method. Only those that you want to run when you execute them require a main method. Now the signature of the main method, it says public, meaning that this is a method that can be used from outside. We have to have it public because basically we uh, execute it from the JVM. We need to have it public. Static means that is a method that belongs to the class. It's not a method that belongs to objects instances of this class. What I mean by that is, again, if we return back to this method first, to that class person, a, me a method that is not public would be something of this kind, public string get first name, which returns the first name. So you see, this method is not static, meaning that I can't invoke it. I can't write get first name because it doesn't know for whom it doesn't have to get first name. However, 
if I say that this get first name is for the object Paul, now it works. So now you actually see the difference between a non-static method, a non-static method, a method that doesn't have static in front of it, means that you can only invoke it for objects instances of that person, of that, op, of that class. How, uh, as opposed to static methods, like the main method that we have here, that you can invoke it for the class itself. So basically from another class, you could write test.main and it will execute this main method. So that's basically the second modifier. The third modifier for the main method is void, meaning that this method does not return anything. Basically the main method executes, it uh, prints everything that needs to be printed and uh, it, it doesn't return anything. There was a question in the chat that I just observed. What did we use this for? So this is actually a keyword uh, in Java used for the current object. So you see, when you invoke person and you want to set the first name and to the last name to basically the Paul Fodor or John Smith, you want to invoke, if you want to set those properties, first name and last name for a specific object, the current object for which this method was called for. This is a keyword, not only in Java, in Python, for instance, is the same keyword, that says this is the current object. So the same way that I would do from outside the file John.firstName, inside the, that specific class, I would use this.firstName. So it means that it refers to the current object. So like for instance, if I have a different variable inside this class first name, okay? Now there is an ambiguity. When I, if I would write, if I want to assign this argument first name to the uh, data field first name, I have to use this keyword in front of it because this basically says that this is the first name data field of the current object. If I wouldn't have this keyword here, nothing, basically what happens, I take the value of first name and I assign it back to the same argument. First name, this first name of the object is still uninstantiated to anything. And in fact, if I run this program now without having the this keyword here, you would see that it doesn't set the first name anymore. The first name is null. It's basically, this is not the first name of the current object. This is the name of uh, this is basically just the argument first name and then assigning and taking the value out of it and putting it back in it. Okay. But because I want to, re to assign it to a poll object, I basically will use the this keyword. Again, it's something that we'll discuss later. I just wanted to show you the fact that a class can be used as a template and the main method is the main entrance point for the program. So this simple example, hello world app, it's saved into a hello world app.java file. It has a comment that basically it's a Java doc comment that says that this is just a simple class that prints the message hello world. It contains a main method and it prints out in the uh, console or command prompt, hello world. And that's basically it. So this is a straightforward one line, one output, uh, uh, program that basically prints that message. Similar to that, let's write a longer program. So the change maker is basically a program that we want to return the change for a certain amount. Like for instance, we want to return the cents uh, if we work in a store. And the input amount is between one and 99 cents. And we first read it with the scanner. I will explain to you what basically that uh, does it creates a object that allows us to read from uh, the standard input system dot in stream a uh, different kind of data so it has methods for getting reading the next integer the next uh, string up to a white space the next string up to the end of the line it has methods for every one of the standard uh, primitive types, next double, next float, next long, next short, next byte, and so on, next Boolean. 
So basically this program, I will actually implement it and I will show you how to run it line by line. So I'm creating a new class, change maker, and the change maker class contains this method. So I'm going to import scanner. So I will tell you about packages next. So by default, when you start your JVM, what you have are the classes that are in one package named java.lang. java.lang is the core of Java. So there are a lot of package uh, classes there, like for instance, system that we are using for uh, printing, uh, string, and so on. There are basically classes that are considered to be essential for any program to run. However, there are many other uh, classes which are not imported in the current user space. For those, there are three different ways to use them. So for instance, I one way to use this scanner class is to prefix the scanner class with where is it from. So java.util.scanner. And you have to do it in every single place where you are actually using scanner. So here java.util dot scanner okay so that's one way to do it you basically prefix every class with where is it coming from another way to import a class in the current user space is to actually have a statement at the beginning of your program that you want to import the scanner class from the java.util.scanner package and now you can use it so again this is the second way to import classes from, some, from other packages. The third way is to import all the members in the java.util package. So java.util.star imports all the members. I highly recommend that. So in java.util, there are many classes, math, scanner, and so on. I do, I, there are about a hundred classes. I don't recommend that you import all of them if you only need one, okay? It's basically the whole point of packages is that you only import in the current user space what you need. So the correct way or the most correct way is to import java.util.scanner. And that basically it's very straightforward and it just imports what you need and nothing else. So next, what do we do in this, uh, in this program? We define a bunch of integer variables. This is something that we discussed last class. You proceed with, with the data type, int, change, remainder, number of quarters, number of dimes, number of nickels, and number of pennies. Then we prompt the user to enter an amount, like between one and 99 cents. We create a scanner object is basically an, an object in Java that lets us to read from the standard input uh, any kind of data type. Then the variable change that was declared before is assigned the result of that input when we read an integer. So we read an integer. So the user will basically enter some value, some integer. If we run this program, you will see, it will ask us what amount do you want? And I say 78 cents. And now it starts executing the rest of the program. So what happens is that it divides that change like 78 with 25 in integer. And it gets that there are, it, the quotient is three of that division. So quarters is equal, it's assigned three. Then the remainder is the remainder of the division with 25. So 78 modulo uh, 25 is three. So basically it's also the remainder is three. Then the dimes is the quotient of the division of the remainder with 10. Three modulo 10 is zero, the quotient is zero. Remainder is still three. Nickels is the result, the quotient of the division of the remainder with five. Three uh, divided with five is giving us quotient zero and the remainder is still three. And now the number of pennies is equal with the remainder. So it's actually three pennies. 
and we print out the result. We print out quarters concatenated with quarters as a string. So that's why we get three quarters and then concatenated with the dimes, plus, uh, concatenated with the string that contains dimes and so on, nickels and three pennies. So that's basically what we did here. We basically ran a program and if you want to run it line by line, which is what we usually do, you double click on the left-hand side to create a breakpoint and then you execute it with a debugger. So the debugger basically lets you execute this program line by line. And you can see now it's asking us to enter an input and we enter 78. And now we can see if we execute this one, the quarters is now three and we continue execution. The remainder is still three and the remainder is the dimes is zero, you see and the remainder is still three, and the nickels is zero, and the remainder is still three, and the number of pennies is three. And finally, the two print statements. There is a question in the chat, person.java acts as a header file for test.java like C++, right? C++ is object-oriented exactly like Java, even the syntax is more or less similar. So basically it's not a header file. So that's the thing about C in, and C++. In C++, you need header files. Header files are just the signatures of all of the methods. Now, Java doesn't need that. Java, you implement the person class and uh, automatically it collects the symbol table, the table of all the symbols, all of the methods, all of the uh, data fields and so on available. So it's similar. Basically, Java evolved out of C++. In fact, the uh, most of the syntax is equivalent. Uh, there are keywords that are different. Java uses abstract. Uh, C++ uses virtual. But other than the small changes, Java is more or less like C++. Okay. The next problem that I want to uh, show you is computing the area of a circle. So again, basically we want a simple program that computes the area of a circle. So we create a file a class compute area with a main method that contains two declarations for two variables, radius and area of the type double. Uh, we assign to the radius 20, and then we compute the area as the expression radius multiply with radius multiply with 3.14159 and finally we display the result like we did it for the uh, change maker we basically can trace it and see what happens at every single line of the code so when we start the program and we have a, a breakpoint uh, at the radius basically the radius is created but there is no value in that radius. Remember that local variables are not initialized by default. And similar for the area, there is no value in that variable until we assign something to it. So the radius is assigned 20, it modifies the location for 20 for the radius. The area is assigned uh, radius multiplied with radius multiplied with 3.14159, an approximation of pi. And basically this assigns a double to the area. And then we print out the result that the area of the circle with radius of 20 is 1,256.636. Okay. And that's basically how the program is executed step-by-step, step, starting the run method to the end. Now let's talk about the different components of this program. So the first thing that we use is a scanner. So a scanner is an object which is in a package called java.util, which is used for reading data from the command prompt. And it has methods for reading data. Next, reads the string up to the first white space. So first white space means any white space, space, tab, a new line, those are all white spaces. Next, we read the word up to the first white space. Next byte reads a byte. 
next short reads a short, next int, next long, next float, next double, next boolean. They basically all read the, their own type of data. Okay. So for instance, if you want to read the double value, you would create a scanner and then you would ask the user basically with input.next double to enter a double value. And again, in order to be to use the scanner class, you have to import it from the Java util package. Now, just to understand what packages are, and then we'll actually go to Eclipse and do again an experiment. Packages are basically groups of classes in order to avoid naming conflicts. So for instance, if you have the same class name in two different places, like for instance, let's say that you are developing uh, COVID tester, like we had last semester in CSC 316. And you have to use both two different databases. You have to use MySQL and Postgres for different reasons. From one of them, you take patients. From the other one, you take, uh, let's say, the type of test uh, kits. So both packages have the same class names. So SQL is in one package and in the other package. What, basically what you have to do is to break these two classes, like these two classes have to be in two different packages, therefore you don't have a name conflict because otherwise you wouldn't know which SQL class are you using, the one in MySQL or the one in Postgres. So Java uses basically a set of packages. When you start Java for the first time, only the fundamental classes are loaded. Those classes that are in the java.lang package. Any other package, if you want to use classes out of them, you have to import those classes. For instance, java.util, we saw it before, has classes for math, has classes for reading with a scanner and so on. If you want to write two files, you need a class name print writer. And in print, print writer it is in another package, java.io. And so on. Basically, during this semester, we will use dozens of packages because they, that's where these classes are. Even you can put your own types into your own packages. So when you define your class in Eclipse, you can define, you can decide that I don't want to use the default package. When I create a new class, I want to put it in my own package. Like for instance, CSE 114. What happens, let's say that there is another test class in CSE 114. And now this is in a different package, is in the package CSE 114. And it starts with the declaration, this class test is in the package CSE 114. So basically you have to declare the, the package and you have to put it in a folder on the hard drive, which is done by Eclipse for you with the name of that package. If you have a sequence of strings separated by dots, then you have a hierarchy. So the first string, like for instance, let me show you an example, java.util.scanner. You it, internally Java has a Java file a folder in which there is a folder util in which there is a class scanner scanner.java. Okay. Now, for some packages, for this kind of packages, in order to import a member like a class and use it, there are three different ways to do it. One way is that you refer to the class with this fully qualified name, basically the package period, the, the name of the class, like java.util.scanner input is equal with a new java.util.scanner for the standard input system.in. Or you import the package or member into the current user space, what we did in this test class uh, or this change maker. We decided that this is the best way to do it. We import basically the entire scanner into our user space. That's the second way. And the third way you import, import the entire package, all the members, scanner, math, and so on, by basically writing import java.util.start, okay? 
Personally, I prefer the middle one because that imports it in the user space with the exception when you want, need two classes with the same name from different packages, then you actually, the only option you have is to refer to them with a fully qualified name, or you can import one of them and the other one you refer it with a fully quantified name. Okay, very good question. So where are these packages? That's the next problem, which is actually right down here on the bottom. So in your operating system, there is a class path environment variable. That class path environment variable is the list of all of the locations where I have Java packages. So for instance, let's say that somebody, George, gives me a set of classes and I want to use them. What I have to do in the operating system, or you can also do it in the Eclipse uh, preferences, is to set your class path to include also that new location. So for instance, on Windows, you would do it with set class path equal with the location where those classes are that George gave us. On Unix or Linux, basically you will have to assign the class path, the that path to the class path variable and then export it. This semester we'll actually not need this. Basically all the classes that you will use this semester are already imported into your user space because we are only using basically, or not the user space, but in your class path. Uh, you are only using things that are in Java, we are not going to use external things from Java. Okay. Now, packages appear to be hierarchical when you see java.util.something or java.awt.star. You would think that when you import java.awt.star, you are importing all of the classes under that uh, prefix, but that's not true. Basically, uh, it only imports the classes directly under java.awt uh, uh, package. So if you have other sub packages like java.awt.color or uh, java.awt.font, if you want to use different fonts, you have to import each one of those separately, like import java.awt.star, import java.awt.color.star and so on. So it's just basically a, a thing to avoid. Uh, if you need objects or classes from various packages, you need to import all of them separately, uh, uh, all of the, these packages separately. There is no way to get everything under Java because there are two reasons for that. One is that these are quite dynamic. In Java, you can add uh, packages on the fly at runtime. Second is that they are quite big. If you import everything from the Java package, including sub, sub uh, packages, it will be a huge amount of different type of classes which you don't need, okay? So that's basically it. Uh, they appear to be hierarchical, but you should import every package with the prefix, correct prefix independently. Now we defined variables before, but we can also define constants with the final modifier. It has the same syntax that we use to uh, define any kind of variables or identifiers with the dif difference that we define it as final. So final double pi is equal with this uh, double. We can basically see that this is a identifier that is defined and initialized only once. You can also do it in two different statements. You can define final double pi semicolon, and then later pi is equal with 3.14159. Basically that also defines the constant uh, the whole point is that you, you can only assign a value to it once. That's it. Now, there is a convention, a style, not a requirement in Java that constants are all uppercase letters. And it actually originated initially in Fortran, where there was no concept of a constant. 
And if you wanted something to be a constant, you would have to, you use uppercase letters and then people that use that identifier would know this is a constant. I shouldn't assign anything to it. So it's just a convention. It's a convention that says constants must be uppercase letters only like pi, size and so on, input and so on. So basically it's something that is only created, uh, it's created and assigned once a value to it. Characters. So until now we define all kind of uh, uh, types. We defined integers, byte, short, long, float, uh, boolean, uh, double, strings. But what about if you have a single character? In Java, you, can, you have a type, a primitive type called car, to which you can assign one character to which variables you can assign one character within single codes. So in Java, single codes are used for characters. Double codes are used for strings, sequences of any number of characters. Okay, And you can assign to character variables, uh, characters in different ways. You can assign directly the character within single codes. You can assign uh, the Unicode of that character, so escape U and then uh, a hexadecimal number, four digits uh, in hexadecimal that basically tell you that uh, this is the Unicode for that letter. It happens that 41 in hexadecimal is four multiplied with 16 plus one, which is 65. And that's actually the code for A. So Unicode, 41 is actually uppercase A. Similarly, Unicode 34 in hexadecimal, this is the encoding for four. So internally, characters are stored as numbers, the Unicode encoding of that character. Therefore, you can actually use any kind of mathematical operations on character variables. Like for instance, we can define the character CH assigned with lowercase a, and you can, pre-increment CH before you print it, and it will print the character for B. Because basically what it is, it's uh, the encoding for lowercase B. Okay. Feel free to stop me to ask me any questions at, uh, that you want at any time. Okay. So you need to- Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I use this these packages in anywhere I want? Like I wrote a code, and then I want to use this code in this in this application. So can I just call these packages? Yes. So for instance, you use you want Java scanner. We put it in change maker. If we want to use it in person, maybe we have here a main method. We can import it here. If we want to use it in test we can import it here. So basically the idea is that you use packages anywhere you want them, anywhere you need them. Okay, I got it, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so Java uses an encoding called Unicode UTF-16, which uses two bytes, 16 bits, to encode any character, uh, basically that is standardized. So for instance, if you want the characters for the Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, those basically have these unicodes, 3B1, 3B2, 3B3. So you have 65,000 different characters that you can represent. And basically the only thing that you can do is to search for them, search for the ones that you are interested. There are big tables like the ASCII table, but for Unicode, that enumerates all kind of all the letters that are available, all of these characters that are available. Okay. Yeah, uh, all the languages known to humans, uh, plus a lot of different uh, extra characters that were created artificially, including signs and so on. In addition to that, we also have a bunch of uh, special characters, like for instance, tab. Tab is that auto size uh, longer white space that basically is used when you want to create a table and you want to uh, align two columns at about the same uh, uh, column. 
line feed is the new char new line character. So basically, if you want, we thought print ln to actually have a new line. If you want to actually print backslash in uh, uh, in in uh, to put backslash in a character, because of the fact that backslash itself is used as an escape character, it after you put one backslash, it still expects was the next one. So basically, you need two backslashes to print one backslash. If you want single code or even double code in a string, basically you need to escape them. Again, the same reason that if you have double code at the end of the uh, at, in a string, it doesn't know if it's the character double code or is the end of the string. Okay, so let me show you some examples of what I'm talking about. So first of all, let me show you tabs. So let's say that I want to print uh, people followed by their age. So Peter slash T for tab. Maybe I also take this out. And now he's 45, new line. And in the next line, John. And he is 15 or five, maybe he's a child of Peter. So we run it. And now you can basically see the difference between tab. So tab is a single character, but what is used for is to uh, uh, align all of the values at one single location. So tab basically lets you to have a variable location. Also, I haven't used print ln. I use just print. And then I use the slash n as the new line character. So basically, I use line fit as a new line. <coughs> if I want to have a backslash in it, like for instance, I want Peter, two backslashes is to actually have a back, uh, one backslash. You see? Now, if I want to have quotes in it, so I want to put Peter within quotes, I have to escape them. Because otherwise, if I don't escape them, it would think that that code is the end of the beginning code. So backward slash code, double code, will basically allow me to basically put Peter within double codes. Yeah, slash n is the new line character. OK, good. Now, because of the fact that characters are internally stored as numbers, you can actually assign them to integer variables. And you can also assign integers to characters. So both of these are totally fine statements. Integer i is equal with lowercase a. And car c is equal with 97. Both of that, you can actually see no error, everything is fine. And you can actually see what the character is. So let's actually print the character C. And it's just lowercase a, 97 is the code for lowercase a. Okay. So you can do arithmetics with uh, the Unicodes. So if I put here plus plus C, is basically printing B because the next the next character after A is B. So it's really it takes 97, it adds one to it, and it gets 98, and 98 is the encoding for the character lowercase b. Okay. Uh, professor? Go ahead. The question, how do we know um, like which numbers correlate with which specific uh, character? So In the first lecture notes last week, one thing that I showed you, but you don't need to remember really, was this table. So in this table, you actually see the letters and their encoding. So lowercase a is 97 and so on. You don't need to remember it. That's the thing that it in time you will remember it. Like I know the codes for these letters because 
uh, after you program a lot, you will actually remember that. But you don't need to, because basically, let's say that I want to see if a letter, I read some letter from the user. I don't know what letter is it. Okay. I want to see if it's lowercase or uppercase. It's actually quite simple to do that. So let me actually show you that. Maybe that clarifies it. So let's say that I create a scanner input. And this is a new scanner for the system input. And now I read a, a string. So input dot next line. Uh, and then for that, oh, I didn't ask you to do that. Uh, and that for that, we take the character at index zero. So that basically is the first character that is entered. And I want to see if this is lowercase letter. So if we'll talk about ifs in a couple of minutes, if lowercase a is less than equal with the character and the character is less than equal with lowercase z, then I had a system.outprintln, I print the character. Otherwise, I don't print the character. So basically, you don't need to remember the codes. So now let's say that we enter R, it prints R. But if I enter uppercase R, it doesn't print it. So basically, you, you don't need to remember the, the codes. 97 is lowercase a, uh, 65 is uppercase a, and so on. You just need to basically use the character itself because it actually plays the role of a number. And all of these are number comparisons. The character is greater than or equal with A and is less than or equal with Z. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. But if you really want to see the ASCII table, I, that's basically the easiest to actually start with. Uh, it's in the lecture notes for the first lecture that we covered last week. Got it. Thanks. Welcome. Okay. So how do you write? Yeah, go ahead. Can I? Uh... Can you use like uh, the plus sign, like I plus plus to get B? Uh, the post increment, so to, the post increment will actually still return the old letter because the post increment says it will increment C, but after it takes the old value of C. Okay. So let me show Can you. Use like plus plus C. Yeah, exactly. So if I change this to plus plus C, I basically, let's say that I enter uppercase R and it returns, it prints out uppercase S. Oh, I see. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Okay. So when you are given an assignment, basically, we usually follow a software engineering process called the waterfall model. It's not always the case, but for small programs, this is what we do. First, we interview the user or the company that hired us to make sure to understand and define the problem. What do they ask for? And to try to basically design what is a use case, what the user will enter as the correct input and what's the expected output. Once we do this, we start designing an algorithm. So we write usually in English or some controlled natural language, uh, like a pseudocode, how to solve the problem step by step. So we read the input, which let's say it's the number of cents that we want to return uh, change. And we now start uh, uh, computing the, co the quarters, the dimes, the nickels, the pennies, and so on. So usually that is written in English. So that's algorithm design. Then we implement the solution. So we kind of like wrote on a piece of paper how we will solve the problem. And now we have to write it in Java using, we define the type of variables. We uh, use the operators that are available in Java. We use the print statements and so on. 
usually nobody writes from the beginning correct programs. Uh, that's why there is a saying that 20% of the price of a software is the development of that software and 80% is maintenance and updating the software. So because basically errors will pop up, uh, changes will pop up, will basically the customer will want additional features, will want uh, maintenance over many, many years and so on. So basically you start with the idea in mind that this is a program that will last for a long time and it needs to be maintained and updated after it's deployed, even if it's on the, so on the customer system hardware. Always use programming style and documentation because either that is somebody else that will maintain the program or it's you, you will not remember what you were doing in the first place. I don't remember programs that I wrote last week, uh, not because I'm old, but because basically it's like you don't remember exact phrases that you said last week in some conversation, in some uh, discussion. Exactly. It's you need to put comments in your program to tell you what you did. What were you doing uh, in that piece of code? Name the variables and uh, methods appropriately, like radius, get first name and so on. So you know what they do, even if you don't go to the source code to look at the method implementation. Use proper indentation. Java doesn't require indentation, but it's a quite a common thing that if your program is indented wrongly, it's hard to read. Okay, if I give you the program like this, it looks ugly and it's hard to read. If you don't want to put indentations, at least after you've wrote the entire program, select it all with control A, and then uh, command shift or control shift F will automatically uh, uh, correct the indentation. Another way is to click right on that selected part and either select format or correct indentation. And that will show your program in a very nice way, like basically as it should be with blocks that are indented, uh, uh, one tab in, in inside and similarly for method blocks and so on. So use the correct indentation, use the same block style, end of line block style, or if you are uh, basically a C programmer, you would use begin of, uh, blocks, uh, begin of line block style but use the correct, the same co uh, consistent block style. So let's take an example, change maker. This program that we basically wrote before, we want to give somebody the correct change. And usually you're asking yourself, what kind of coins do we want to give uh, that person? Uh, the problem is to give the minimum number of coins to cover the amount. And yes, like for instance, we have pennies, uh, nickels, dimes, quarters. Actually, we also have $1 coins and $2 coins, but they are extremely rare. In fact, the only time I got a $2 coin was at a Stony Brook Rail Railroad station. If you pay with cash, it gives you for some reason $2 coins and $1 coins as the change. They are quite rare. I've never seen them after and again. In fact, there is a story that somebody was once arrested uh, for trying to pay something with $2 coins and the uh, people at the store didn't know that they exist. So basically, they are very rare. So basically, we decide that the coins that we are using for our program are quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, most common ones. The requirements of the program is to take the input from the user as an integer between one and 99 and display the change breakout. Uh, basically uh, three quarters, zero dimes, zero nickels and, uh, and three pennies. So for this, we basically need to usually do what is called requirements analysis. Understand and define the program, ask the user or the customer for what is what they want, 
and the user in this case tells us that they want us coins maximum ch ch uh, change 99 cents and they want to display uh, the coin output to be displayed what is involved in the requirement analysis interviewing the users or the company that hired you what are their expectations for the program in fact there is a standard uh, type of visual diagram called user diagrams or use case diagrams which actually allows one to communicate easier with the customer to draw what are the inputs what are the outputs that the user and what are the use cases that the user expects it involves writing a document called requirement analysis report or uh, requirement specification there is in fact an ieee template for writing such a pro, uh, software requirement analysis next we determine the input and the outputs the user basically will enter a number and we print the number of quarters dimes nickels and pennies then we design an algorithm designing an algorithm means write a, a pseudocode to actually compute the minimum chain uh, number of coins and what kind of coins so how do we get the quarters first we basically have to divide by 25 get a quotient and that's actually how many quarters we can use to return the correct uh, the correct change once we have that number of quarters we subtract those quarters that's the remainder after division we get the module the remainder of the division and we continue so we execute the same way for dimes for nickels and for pennies we usually write a pseudocode a pseudocode or a flowchart basically that first the user enters the original amount then that the number of quarters this is almost like english if you think about it's like python because python is very close to english you have that quarters is assigned original amount divided with 25. you don't need to put types you don't need to define methods you basically just enumerate these are the steps to compute the result and even output you just write output number of quarters like print the result once you have the algorithm and this makes sense to you you start implementing it in java so you implement the change maker in java and as I said, nobody writes perfect code, so you need to start debugging it line by line, and you basically start uh, executing line by line and see how the program executes. Okay. So that's basically how we write programs. Now, any questions? If not, I will stop recording.